behind the scenes helping us out. So if you do um, have a question, a comment or anything, please let us know in the chat box. They will either answer directly or uh, after we chat a little bit, we can jump on and we can try to answer any of those questions. Um, now I'm saying we because we have Kelly. Kelly, jump in here. There we go. Hi. Kelly is our zookeeper that's going to be helping us and uh, share all about our ringtail lemurs today. Um, so today we travel to Madagascar, which is a island off the coast of the continent of Africa, um, off the east coast. And uh, we're going to be saying hi to some prosimians. Now, what is a prosimian? Well, a prosimian is a primate. And because these guys are primates, we have N95 masks on, right? So we have our N95 masks because, of course, we are still in our uh, coronavirus protection. And primates, we know, because we are primates, are susceptible to getting those viruses. Uh, so whenever Kelly is a zookeeper or when we are getting close to them, we have to wear these N95 so that we do not share anything that we have, also we can get stuff that they have. So we have that PPE, which everyone should know now, since we are seven months into a pandemic, everyone should know what PPE is, our personal protective equipment. And those are things that help protect us from these different viruses, these different uh, um, infections that we can acquire. So Kelly, hello, hello, welcome to Wild Wednesday. Kelly actually joined us for our grizzly bear. So you guys should probably recognize her uh, she jumped on when we were doing our grizzly bear. And uh, we're going to flip our camera around now that we've talked a little bit about what we're doing. And I'm going to let Kelly introduce who our lemurs are. So, Kelly, who do we have? So, we have um, three boys in our small bachelor group. So, we have half brothers. We have Lyndon, Elm, and Oak. Um, and they all share the same dad, but they have different moms. And they came from the same large troop. And we've had them here for a while, and they're going to be eight. So, so we've got Elm, Oak, and Linden. Now, I look at them, and I see all three ringtail lemurs, and I cannot tell who is who. So um, now I know they have identifying markers. I know you, just by looking at them, you can tell. But what are some identifying markers that you are looking at to know who is who? So Elm is actually the one that's kind of on the lower rock. Um, if you look at his face, you can see the black around his eyes. It kind of goes up into the black around his uh, top of his head. So he has eyebrows. So that's our defining factor for Elm, that he Elm. has eyebrows. Okay, and then what about this one that's closest to us sitting on the rock with a leg down? So that is Lyndon. So Lyndon has a nice little bull head. So his dark on the top of his head, he's got a nice white border. Okay. He doesn't have eyebrows. Okay, I see that. And then the one with his back to us is Oak, and he has a nice little white dot right in between his eyes at the base of his, uh, at the start of his snout. And Oak isn't wanting to cooperate quite with us at the moment. Um, just, so be able to see that, but uh, yeah, so each one definitely has their own identifying markers. And, you know, I know people come into the zoo all the time and they see our uh, animals where we have multiple individuals in there and they're like, how do you tell the difference? We do have ways and, you know, it's important for us to know who is who. Now, behaviorally, how Wait, are Jen? they different? Yes. Uh, so it sounds like um, everyone was having a little bit of trouble hearing Kelly. Okay. I I'm trying, we'll have Kelly talk into the microphone a little bit, a little bit more. So we've got a, with these N95 masks on, it's a little bit challenging. I do have an external microphone. So we're trying to get a little bit closer to it, but um, we'll, we'll try to do better. Sorry guys. Um, so we just introduced uh, our three boys, Elm, Oak, and Linden, and how to tell the difference between each one of them. Each one of them has slight variations in color and marking. Uh, but Kelly, what about behaviorally, it, do, do they, act different is one of them more you know confident or social like what's their behavior like so we um we do have a hierarchy in our troop so um elm is our dominant male um oak is kind of in the middle and then linden is going to be kind of the bottom of our totem pole so they do kind of have their own social structure like all primates do um oak is definitely very curious he will come over he's very laid back um you'll often see him just kind of hanging out by himself um elm and linden spend a lot of time together um and you'll see them often sitting together but elm is definitely the first one to investigate he wants to know 
what you have, what's going on. Um, and he is definitely the first one that wants the banana. He's going to get it first. All right. Now, three boys we have here. And you said that we have a dominant one. But if we had a female in this group, the female would actually be more dominant because this is a, a, a female dominated species. It's a hierarchy where the females are kind of at the top of the list and they really control the troop. These are very gregarious species where they can hang out with you know, 20 to 30 of their family members. And again, typically the females are at the top of that and um, there's always a dominant female. Now, these guys, the lemurs, are known for um, a couple of their amazing traits. Now, as I said, these guys are primates, so they are uh, genetically related to us, to monkeys, to apes, um, but they do have a couple different characteristics that are a little bit different. Uh, the prosimians actually evolved uh, pre-ape, and it was because they were really marooned on the island of Madagascar, uh, that they have this very unique diversity. And if we were to look back at fossil records, even around 2000 years ago, we would see lemurs that were the size of gorillas. Uh, so we have fossil records that have these very giant lemurs. Um, those species now do not exist. Um, there is about a hundred different species of lemurs on the island of Madagascar, and they are isolated to that area. Now, they are considered a critically endangered species because unfortunately about 90% of their natural habitat has been eliminated within the last 150 years, and even more about 40% in the last 70 years down from that. So these guys are definitely struggling, not only the ringtail lemur, um, but all of the lemur species are really struggling because of their habitat. Now, these guys typically are on the ground. I mean, they definitely can climb, but Kelly, do you see them on the ground more or, or up in the trees? So our guys will kind of alternate on where they want to be. Uh, they love the rock pile right behind our palms, so they'll hang out there. Um, they'll hang out on the rocks where they are right now. So ring-tailed lemurs especially are going to be your rock dwellers. Um, most other lemur species are going to spend a lot of time up in the trees and um, moving about the canopy, but these guys are going to be living on cliff faces and rock piles and things like that, so they're more ground-dwelling lemurs. Yeah, definitely more of a terrestrial animal, um, and some of those lemurs spend almost their entire lives, a black and white rough lemur can spend their entire life up 200 feet in the air in the rainforest canopies of Madagascar. Um, now this species is obviously getting its name because of the ring tail. Um, and uh, they will use that tail as communication. So one of the things we know lemurs do really well is they have audible communication and they have physical communication. And so Kelly, tell us a little bit about how these animals will communicate with each other. So these guys have really distinct scents. Um, and they have scent glands on their wrists and the base of their tail. So they will actually, if they find a troop um, that comes into their little territory, they will have what's called a stink war. So the boys are gonna be rubbing their um, scent glands from their wrists all over their tails, and then they will kind of fling their tail in the direction of the oppose, um, opposing lemur and kind of have a stink war and get all of their scent out there. Um, these guys will also scent mark they have a gland at the base of their tail, so you'll often see our boys rubbing their butts um, on different things to make sure that it smells like them. Yeah, and out of all the lemurs, the ringtail lemur, lemur is the most territorial of all those species, and you can get these giant troops really going after each other and flinging these, uh, their, their tail swapped smell at each other. And um, hopefully that's enough to either uh, patrol their territory or potentially take over a territory. Now, lemur, the Latin uh, translation of lemur is ghost or spirit. And we believe that that comes from the vocalizations that these animals make. They make some pretty amazing vocalizations that they communicate with as well. Yeah, so these guys have a large um, variation in their vocal things. Our boys will do a lot of just the basic call of where you are. Um, it's kind of a short little is what they normally do. 
Um, but there is, they do have other um, vocalizations that we will do for enrichment. We will um, play different lemur vocalizations for them to get them to exhibit those vocalizations and just to hear other lemurs. Yeah, it's quite amazing to be able to hear them. Now, I would say the ringtail, we have two species of lemurs here. We have our ringtails we're looking at here. Then we have the black and white rough lemurs. We'll probably do those either next week or the week after. Another amazing species. Um, these guys, I feel, are a little bit more quiet than the black and white rough. Um, those guys, when they start sounding off, I mean, it's a fairly eerie sound. And I think that's really where they get that, you know, goes to the forest because they've got this loud screech. It's quite amazing to hear an, a noise come out of, a large noise come out of such a small animal. Uh, now, one of the things, Kelly, that you do is training. And these guys, being a primate, um, they are able to pick up quite a few behaviors. So talk to us a little bit about the training you, you do with our lemurs. So we do um, training with these guys just to be able to get a good visual check on them. Um, since they are a social, they do have a developed social structure. We want to make sure that there wasn't an incident while we weren't here. Um, check their body, make sure they're not missing any hair, any scratches or anything like that. Um, so these guys will do targets with their nose. Um, we're also working on hand presents. Um, they also do up, so they will climb up the fence in front of us so that we're able to get a good look at their belly and their underside. And then we're also working on getting them crate trained, and they are scale trained, so we weigh these guys every two weeks. Now, all this training, of course, is done through a protective barrier. You can see that there's a barrier between us right now and our lemur. And so all that training is done with positive reinforcements. Kelly, let's talk a little bit about their diet because uh, it's very unique and it's unique throughout the different lemur species. Um, these guys love fruit. Yeah. So these guys are going to be mostly a fruitivore, so they eat mostly fruit. Um, here at the zoo, we give them a good variety. They get um, primate chow. So they get our browse biscuits that are made for kind of browsers in the primate world. And then they also get a mix of our low starch cinnamon or banana. Um, and then they get different greens every day. Today was kale. And then we get a little bit of veg and a little bit of fruit um, in a mix. But they also get grapes and berries every single day. And they get a full banana to split between them throughout the day. Now today, a special treat, we have another banana. Um, and I think that they've been very patient waiting here. So maybe we're going to let Kelly... Um, feed some banana here because I think our lemurs have been amazing uh, watchers for us and have looked at this banana long enough that I think we should give it to them. Um, so Kelly mentioned a different type of eater that we haven't really talked about. We've talked about omnivores, herbivores, and carnivores, but we have not talked about frugivores. So frugivores, just like Kelly said, are animals that really are designed to eat fruit. Now these guys will eat some bugs, um, and uh, some other vegetables, but the majority of their diet are, is fruit. And they're also known as the great pollinators. The black and white rough lemur, which again, we'll get to in a couple of weeks, um, they are the, uh, the highest pollinator in the world. Uh, and that's because these guys are gonna go down and they're going to, one, be disturbing all those fruiting plants, which is then gonna, of course, get the pollen onto their fur, and as they travel from one tree to the another, they cross pollinate, uh, which helps those trees continue gr new growth. Um, so it's extremely important that not only do we maintain a habitat of where these animals live, but also that they are such a keystone species in their ecosystem to maintain all that healthy nature that not only the lemurs need, but all the other animals need on the Madagascar rainforest where our lemurs are gonna live. Now, again, you see that Kelly One again has that N95 mask on, but we are also wearing our PPE gloves. Um, and we do this with all of our primates or any of our species that could be susceptible to any viruses that we have or that we could have, and or if we could be susceptible to anything that they have. Um, so, and you see that they even like licking off the peel there, uh, might even bite a little bit of that peel. And these guys do have great dexterity 
within their hands. So you can see that they are grabbing just like our primates do. Um, and if we get a good shot at their teeth, these guys have specially evolved tooth combing teeth. Remember, this is a gregarious species. They like to hang out with each other um, in large troops. And so grooming is a big social structure of what they will do. They will sit there and their lower incisors, so the teeth that are kind of in the front on their lower uh, jaw, those are specialized tooth combing uh, teeth that allow them to groom their fur. Uh, so a animal that definitely evolved to be living in a group, which is why we have a group of them here. Um, they enjoy the company of each other and they will also look out for each other. They will share food with each other. Um, and if we had a female, again, that female would be very dominant. Uh, now, Kelly, it's interesting with our females, they will all kind of synchronize breeding and breeding with a lemur is um, a very small window. So the female only comes in estrus uh, once a year, I believe, for a very short amount of time. Is that correct? That's correct. It's only about 48 hours. So 48 hours is a window pretty much once a year that a female is receptive. Um, they typically will have one to two kids at a time. And those youngsters will hang on to mom um, as she's traveling through until they are old enough uh, to be able to go on their own. Um, we, of course, have not had any offspring here because we just have our three boys, um, which makes up our troop here at the Reed Park Zoo. Uh, now, one of the other really cool things about lemurs and Reed Park Zoo is the connection that we have with the University of Arizona. Uh, the University of Arizona has a lemur researcher, Dr. Stacy Peacock, um, who does lemur research on the island of Madagascar. And she is trying to see different hormone levels in lemurs by looking at their scat or their poop. Um, so poop in the animal world is, is liquid gold or brown gold. Um, and uh, that's something where we can learn a lot about the individual, a lot about their genetics, um, and we can actually test cortisol levels. Uh, so she has a lab, it's called LEAP, uh, and what she's looking, it's an endocrinology lab, uh, which is looking at those different levels to try to learn more about not just the ringtail lemur, the black and white rough lemur, um, but uh, all of our species of prosimians that live on the island of Madagascar. So what a cool connection. Uh, we have worked with Dr. Teacott here at the Reed Park Zoo. Um, to collaborate with her students and um, even with her project and another great way that we are working with our local university to learn more about these species. Uh, as I said, these animals are a critically endangered species because majority is habitat loss uh, and defragmentation of um, those habitats, which makes it challenging uh, for those troops to grow and also to move from one area to the other. So now it's kind of, what, well, what can you do? Well, what, what can we do? We don't live in Madagascar. Uh, most of us have never had an opportunity to visit Madagascar. Uh, so how do we help lemurs here in Tucson? Well, that can be a little bit challenging, but you know, as I've said every single time, you guys are doing it right now. All you that are on this chat right now, you guys are helping lemurs because you're supporting an institution that is doing conservation work, that is educating the public about what's going on with species around the world. And by doing that, by educating people, by protecting those areas, we can protect these animals. So we can also do things um, like being able to shop sustainably. So there's a couple of really great organizations out there that you can look for that are certified uh, to make sure that the products that you're getting are sustainable. Uh, not all the products that we see or purchase at our grocery store, online, come from sustainable ways of gathering those items, whether it's seafood, whether it's wood, whether it's um, meat, whether it's fruits and vegetables, uh, palm oil, any of those things. We wanna make sure that we're supporting the organizations that are doing 
good practices and protecting habitats, and we want to go past those products that are not, so that we can encourage those other companies to start doing better practices. So um, we have this information on our website, reefarkzoo.org. You can go to conservation and you can kind of see this stuff, but look for um, certificates from the Rainforest Alliance certified, Rainforest Alliance certified. Um, that's saying that any sort of uh, wood products are certified by that organization, meaning they were sustainably harvested. Uh, Forest Forever, uh, that's another one that you can make sure that anything that has that seal on it means that it is harvested in a sustainable way. And then there is a certified sustainable palm oil by RSPO, RSPO. Um, those symbols, again, let us know as consumers that we are putting our money to organizations or to companies that are protecting the environment. And if we want to see lemurs around in the future, this is what we need to do. This is what we need to do. We need to learn about them. We need to study them. We need to see what their plight is, what, it is, uh, what, what are their challenges in the wild, and then how do we solve those challenges? And we can do this. Uh, we've done this with several different species. Uh, so now that we've talked a little bit about lemurs, I want to hear from you guys. I do see that we've got uh, a couple questions out there. Emily, do we have any questions that Kelly or I can answer? Yeah, I think so. Um, so one question is, do we have any plans to get a female for this troop? Um, no, we don't. So lemurs in the wild would have would form bachelor groups once they've left their home troop. Um, and in our um, human care population, we do have a large amount of boys. Um, so we keep bachelor groups um, to kind of give them the home and use them as um, ambassadors for their species. And with our boys, since they are half brothers, they are very bonded. Um, so we will probably keep just the three of these um, and keep them. Uh, we don't want to add anybody to the mix um, since they're so bonded. We don't want any fighting or anything like that. And remember that we talk about the species survival program where each species has their own um, stud book and stud book keeper that holds the genetic lineage of each individual animal. So when we are uh, recommending individuals for breeding, we are looking at their entire family tree. So we're looking at compatibility. Um, how old is that animal? Are they post-reproductive? Um, do they have any th sort of uh, genetic issues that we may not want to pass those lines on. And also, how much is how many individuals are out there in one gene pool line? We don't want every single lemur genetically related. So uh, just like Kelly said, some zoos step up and say, well, we're just going to house uh, the boys. We'll have a bachelor troop here. And another zoo may be a breeding troop. And um, their troop may be definitely set up for that. So um, this is where all of our AZA zoos are working cooperatively to all save these species and solve that great problem, which is to end extinction. So um, our troop here, our troop of boys helps out with all of those lemurs to tell that story. All right, Emily, you got another one? Yeah, and I think this one's uh, more for you, Jed. Um, somebody says, you've talked before about not being able to put endangered species back into wild habitats that can't support them. Could lemurs potentially live wild elsewhere in the world? It would be challenging because these animals are specialized. Um, the ringtail lemur is actually fairly good at adapting to new environments. Um, some of them, like the black and, what, black and white rough lemur, they are specialized into their area, into their habitat. Uh, Madagascar is a fairly big island and, you know, it has the rainforest, it has dry deserts. Um, it's not just all one ecosystem. And so it's broken up into several different ecosystems. So potentially some species would, but then we look at, okay, what could be the disruptive nature of the lemur in an ecosystem or habitat that has not evolved to have this new species? And that's where we look at would they become an invasive species? Um, so does that environment or can that environment support them not only with the size, but with their resources, with food and water? Um, but would they 
decimate an area if there was no predators to keep down on their numbers designed to be able to go after because lemurs do have predators. There's a fossa uh, in Madagascar. There are birds of prey um, that are going to be going after these guys. And, you know, they do need, we need a, we need a balance between our predators and our prey. And so it would be very challenging. Is it possible? Well, it could be possible. Um, you know, enough research could be done and an area could be selected to bring lemurs in. Um, the bigger challenge would be finding that area and being able to protect that area because a lot of those um, that pop into my mind would be on mainland Africa. And unfortunately, a lot of those areas, we are also trying to um, protect those spaces. So, you know, everyone kind of says, well, you know, if they're endangered in the wild, why don't we just breed a bunch and put them back out there? And then, you know, problem solved. But we haven't solved the problem of why. And so that's what we have to do first. We solve the problem of why, and then we can talk about a reintroduction program. Um, so the bigger thing, the safer thing uh, would be, well, let's try to save that habitat first, and then let's grow um, those species numbers out there in the wild. And if we need to talk about a reintroduction program at that point, once we've solved those problems, well, that's where zoos can step in. And we have seen successful programs like the California condor, like the black-footed ferret, uh, like the, the, the oryx, um, those are animals that were on the brink of extinction. Very few numbers brought them in, protected the area, um, were able to raise those numbers, reintroduce, and now those animals are thriving. So it's, it's not out of the question, but it's not where we're at right now. Thank you, Jed. That was very thorough. Um, see, we have a couple of questions. Uh, are ring-tailed lemurs related at all to quadamundis? They are not in the same uh, 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 category, so family order. Um, so the Quadamundae um, are, I don't believe they are a Musilidae. Uh, they're, I mean, obviously they are on some level because they're on the Mammalia, uh, which is the, you know, the, the main group order, uh, but the Quadamundae are not primates. Um, so the lemurs um, kind of separate from the monkeys and the apes. Um, into the prosimian, but they are primates. And so uh, very different than uh, Aquatamundae. What is the reason for their black and white striped tail? Good question. My guess, um, and Kelly, you can jump in here too. Uh, my guess is probably communication, uh, that they are using that as, again, we talked about the territorial stink bombs as they're wafting that tail. Uh, also, as they are going, a lot of times there's fairly thick brush uh, or landscape that they're moving through, and it's a way that they can communicate with each other by lifting that tail up so one can spot the other. Uh, they definitely will communicate just by movement of the tail, uh, so there could be an alert flag, and for younger lemurs, they will probably be able to follow the adults much easier. Uh, if they can see that black and white kind of flag that's flying up there. So that would be my observational uh, answer. Uh, I don't know, Kelly, do you have something different that you think? Yeah, I mean, a lot of times when scientists, when researchers are looking at, you know, why does an animal have a certain adaptation? We've got to study that animal first. We've got to see, well, what are they using it for? You know, why, what is the, the, um, the, black and white tail being used for and then we can try to ascertain some answers from that information uh, and sometimes we have to look at you know predator prey relationships if we look at a zebra remember we talked about the zebra with their black and white stripes they're trying to blend into each other and their main predator the lion is colorblind so that black and white stripe helps them to create that strobe light effect and it helps them to blend into the black and white vision field of uh, their predator. So that's, you know, sometimes we have to look at not only themselves, but also the animals they may interact with. Uh, one of the things we didn't talk about with these guys is their eyes. Uh, lemurs are known for these great big eyes. Um, a lot of them are nocturnal. Now the ringtail lemur is a diurnal species. That means they're awake during the day and asleep at night, like most of us, not 
everyone is like that, but uh, most of us are diurnal. And, um, but there are some species that are strictly adapted for the nighttime. Uh, our black and white rough lemurs, they are more nocturnal. Um, the species that we may all know is that eye eye um, that has that really long, long finger that does that tapping. Um, so those guys have the great big O eyes and that tells us that they need those larger eyes to be able to bring in as much light as they can uh, at nighttime. And Jed, somebody says that you piqued their interest when you stated that lemurs may have been as large as gorillas millions of years ago. Uh, can you talk more about that and how we know they might have been that large? Well, we've got fossil records and um, it's not even millions of years ago. We have uh, information potentially 2,000 years ago, um, which may sound like millions of years, but um, you know, even 2,000 years ago, we have fossil records. So we have um, skeletons that have been excavated from um, different sites and mines in Madagascar, um, which lead us to believe that uh, there were lemurs that varied in sizes and even again, one as large as a gorilla. So, um, you know, if we start looking at some of our prehistoric ancestors, um, we can see very different creatures, but ones that definitely mimic or mirror uh, species we have today. You know, think about the great mammoth or the woolly rhino or um, some of these lemur species uh, that are significantly larger um, than what we have today. But you know, we have their ancestors that have, you know, survived the odds or evolved to the changing environment, um, the climate, whatever it is, the food, the food source. Um, and, you know, so we do see those relatives. But, uh, yeah, pretty amazing to think that we would have, you know, giant lemurs uh, roaming around the island of Madagascar. Uh, that would be pretty impressive to see. And so all lemurs live in Madagascar. Um, do lemur, different lemur species cohabitate with each other? They do, yeah. And we'll actually see that. Remember I talked about that um, some of these animals are very specialized. And being specialized means that you can focus on one resource, one food source where, um, you know, a different lemur that specializes in something else is going to be able to focus on a different resource. So ring-tailed lemurs will live with other lemur species. Remember we talked, these guys are diurnal and they're mostly terrestrial. So they live with nocturnal arboreal animals. So those are animals that are awake at nighttime and that are gonna be more up in the trees. So one, um, it takes the, the top trees, these guys take the ground and now we're not competing for resources. Uh, so we definitely see different lemur species that are able to cohabitate together and do absolutely fine and everyone has shared resources in that habitat but that again shows um, how important that specific habitat is because you're not just protecting it for one species you know we use these um, megafauna or these charismatic animals to highlight the, the the dangers of what's going on there in a in a specific habitat but when we protect it we protect it for everybody else that's there as well so not just the ring-tailed lemurs but all the other species they live with Is the government of Madagascar cooperating with conservation efforts? Um, it's a touch and go. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing. And I, I don't want to get too much into the political nature of uh, the Madagascar government, because to be honest, I don't know a lot about of uh, what that looks like. But I do know that um, there is a lot of money in uh, the wood and in mines at, uh, in Madagascar. And uh, I, I have a, a feeling that that money probably drives a lot of decisions. And um, those decisions typically are not set up to protect the land. Uh, I'm not well versed enough in Madagascar and government to be able to you know, give you guys enough information. So I, so I don't wanna go there, but um, I will say that's typically what we're looking at when we see an area that um, is losing a lot of their habitat. Uh, and there's other resources that are there that are more valuable than the perceived uh, habitat and the animals that live there. And that looks like um, that's all of our questions. 
Uh, so All did right. you have any parting words for us today? Yeah, we just want to say, uh, first off, uh, thank you to Kelly for hanging out with us and uh, introducing her, us to her amazing lemurs. Um, thank you to Emily and Gail for helping on uh, all of our chats, and especially thank you to all of you guys, our Zoom members who have tuned in today. Hopefully you guys have got to learn a little bit more about a ringtail lemur, an amazing species from Madagascar um, that's so charismatic, that's so amazing, and one that definitely needs our help. So we truly appreciate you guys being here with us, everything that you guys are doing and being a part of Reed Park Zoo. And with that, I want to say we, we do have a couple events coming up, so I'll talk about those real quickly. We've got uh, Zusan, which is all virtual, so it's an all live event. That will be next Friday, so Friday is coming up. Not this Friday, but October 2nd, uh, Friday. It is a free event, so. It is a free event. Let me talk in the microphone. It's a free event um, that you guys can uh, sign up on right now. We have our silent auction that's actually live right now, so you don't have to wait. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff on there. Bids are coming in. So those things jump on there. Again, it's a free event. Um, I will be hosting it with one of our board members, Edmund, and we've got a lot of fun things, fun activities for that evening. And then I think we have a will shot coming up, Emily. Uh, yeah, there's a why a will workshop tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, it's also virtual. Uh, you can find it under our events page on our website, um, but we're going to have another one of our uh, board directors, um, Denise Shepard, and she's going to be kind of talking through end of life uh, paperwork, why it's important to have a will and all of that uh, good information to know. And that's a free one as well. So um, if you were interested in that, on um, getting your will set up, which is an extremely important thing for everyone to do, uh, you have a free workshop from an amazing attorney. Um, I have known Denise for over 15 years now. She's an amazing woman, uh, so definitely, if you're interested in that, go on to our website, events there. So we got a lot of fun stuff coming up. And then, of course, we will have another chat next Wednesday. Um, I'm thinking about South American aviary, either that, or we'll go say hi to our black and, wealth, black and white rough leaner, lemurs. So we'll do one and then the other. So I'm not sure which one we'll do, so stay tuned to that. Uh, we'll get it to Emily, and she'll get that information out. So again, thank you, guys. Hope you have a wonderful rest of your Wednesday. And from Kelly and I, we will see you guys later. Bye. Thank Stay well, Tucson. Everyone.